welcome to everyone to uh, what we enjoy doing most is sharing the experience of flying in space, especially with those that did so much work to make it all happen for us. As Mr. Abbey said, this was a really successful flight, and uh, I think uh, we proved that we're ready to go on to International Space Station in cooperation with our Russian, European, and Japanese and Canadian partners and, and do even bigger and better things. Uh, I will uh, introduce the crew, of course, and then we'll show you some slides and a video that highlight the, uh, the mission. Um, as I introduce the crew, it, the thought comes to mind that it's becoming more and more of a daunting task for the commander to make introductions with uh, part of the crew leaving, uh, being left on orbit, leaving the crew on the way up, and a new member of the crew joining us on the way down. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the way over here, in, in addition to those complications of who's on the crew when, uh, we thought we'd lost Jerry this afternoon when his wife Catherine was uh, about to, uh, who was about to give birth, was uh, we thought on our way to the hospital, but I guess that's going to be a little later. But uh, we're looking forward to a new lineager in the in the uh, NASA family here real shortly. Um, I guess uh, what we ought to do to introduce the crew is uh, start with the first slide, which is the the crew photo, and uh, I will that way be able to introduce also those that aren't with us uh, today. The, uh, the crew, uh, as you see it here, uh, has a lot of background with the Phase One program. Eileen Collins, as our pilot, uh, had made the first uh, approach on Discovery STS-63 uh, a couple of, almost two and a half years ago now, I guess, and uh, at that point in time, she was able to wave across the window, uh, across space through the window at Elena Kondakova, who was on the mirror. And uh, at the same time, Mike Fole was on board with uh, Vladimir Titov on Discovery. So we have a, an ever-growing family here that uh, is uh, continuing to fly these missions. Um, the, uh, the two primary payloads that we call them, the precious payloads, were Jerry Leninger and Mike Fole as our Phase One crew members. Uh, Jerry completed a very long and rigorous program on board the Mir, and Mike uh, uh, arrived on Mir a beneficiary of a lot of the work that Jerry did. And so um, Mike is continuing to carry out that program in fine fashion as we're all watching with interest the progress they're making uh, recovering the mirror and bringing it back online. Uh, the uh, MS-1 is uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoix, who is from the European Space Agency. And uh, he had uh, also done some training in Russia uh, as a backup for an eventual flight on Mir. Uh, again, another connection from our crew to the cooperation that we've had with the Russians. Uh, our two new flyers, uh, Ed Liu and Carlos Noriega. Uh, Carlos was MS-2. Uh, he was our flight engineer and uh, does a wonderful job at uh, keeping the pilot and the commander out of trouble, I might add. And uh, he comes from Peru, and uh, his family moved to the United States when he was only five years old. And similarly, Ed uh, is of Chinese descent. His parents moved to the US right before he was born. So as you look at this group, you see a really international mix. Uh, representation from uh, basically six different cultures because we count Mike Foles' British uh, background as a, as a yet different culture from our own. But uh, it's the kind of thing that I'm sure we're going to see on future International Space Station flights. And uh, it was a pure pleasure for us to be able to work together in a group like this because uh, we were able to learn from each other, learn about each other's cultures, and, uh, and move forward with uh, new ideas for uh, future space flights. The, uh, the two folks that you don't see here are, of course, uh, Vasily Tsebleyev and Sasha Lazuki in the Mir-23 crew, who uh, both Jerry and Mike are, uh, have worked with, and Mike is continuing to work with. Uh, we consider them honorary members of our crew, and uh, we really look forward to seeing them return to Earth here in September. This is a crew patch, and uh, the most important thing on a crew patch are the names of the crew. You see here the eight people involved in this flight, the two uh, front seaters, Charlie and Eileen, then uh, the two phase one uh, long duration uh, astronauts and uh, the other mission specialist. It shows obviously it's a special flight uh, in low Earth orbit. The sixth mission to Mir is symbolized by the six stars around the Mir in Cyrillic, which means Mir means peace and also world in Russian. And uh, the shuttle Mir flights are part of phase one of the International Space Station program that's why you have the phi, the Greek letter phi, with one star, which symbolizes the phase one program, also with the rising sun, showing the early phase of the Space Station International program. 
Our launch occurred on May 15th at 4.07 in the morning, and it was right on time at the beginning of a seven-minute launch window. We had uh, little to no problems during the launch countdown, and the SN itself was absolutely trouble-free. And you know, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say again for the whole crew, uh, thanks to all you folks here at JSC and the folks down at Kennedy Space Center that did such a wonderful job getting our orbiter ready for flight. And because the orbiter was in such good shape during the whole mission, we had time to do the extra things that we had planned on doing before launch. Uh, this is a view of Mir from a far uh, distant uh, picture, and the reason we wanted to show this is the first time we saw Mir, it was a very small star. It looked like a star. Um, we, uh, our main engine cutoff occurred in low, very low Earth orbit, approximately 100 miles. Uh, well below Mir, gave us time to uh, uh, catch up to Mir, and we did several burns over the course of the next uh, two days. And flight day two, we, uh, we uh, prepared for the rendezvous, and on flight day three, we did the actual final phase of the rendezvous. You see the overhead window in the flight deck uh, with Mir in the background, the uh, station keeping. Uh, Mir is on the top of the overhead window, and uh, you can see the handheld LIDAR, which is a manual laser pointing tool, which is used to, uh, to have a very basic uh, measure measurement of the range and range rate of the target, which is Mir, uh, to confirm uh, data from other sensors like the TCS or radar. And the first good hit was about 16,000 feet, and uh, that was a very important tool to ensure to the, the flying person, to Charlie, that uh, all the automatic sensors were working fine. This is a, a view about 400 feet away. You start to see, uh, you can identify the different modules at the top. You see uh, the Soyuz and working your way uh, clockwise. You see a Spectre, then the base block. Uh, below that is Kavant 1 and a Progress. Uh, work your way, uh, continue clockwise. You've got Kavant 2. Right in the center you see the docking module where we would dock. Directly behind that is Cristal, which can't be seen. And then beyond on the far side of the node, is a Perota. And uh, this is the view we have, of course, as we're coming up the R bar from beneath the station during the final part of the approach. Um, you have to imagine that you're weightless for a minute and do a 180 flip here because our view is actually uh, as if you were standing on your head because the, the actual base block was uh, at the top of our image. But um, in any event, uh, sense of direction is not really all that important in, uh, in orbit as far as whether you're upside down, left, right, or right side up. But uh, we have a view like this, essentially after uh, we've done a tail forward maneuver to uh, align ourselves coming up the R bar, and as Carlos said, about 400 feet uh, from here on in, we're maintaining a vertical position beneath the station to keep the docking port uh, of the orbiter uh, lined up with the docking port of the mirror. And this shows a little bit of the activity that goes on in the flight deck. Once we get into the manual phase, it gets very intense and very busy. Uh, I've got the rockets. Uh, uh, Go Rockets hat on there, hoping that uh, we're going to make it to the finals, but uh, in spite of that, we had a lot of work going on around us uh, with Carlos, you can see, looking over my shoulder. He was the quarterback of the whole operation, making sure that everyone was keeping up and synchronized with all of the events in the checklist. We have uh, essentially five people doing various things in, uh, in sync to make this all work. Uh, Eileen was uh, working the RPOP, or the Rendezvous Proxops uh, uh, display for us so that we could see our trajectory relative to the mirror and make proper corrections. And uh, Jean-Francois, as you saw, was using the handheld laser looking out the window. Elena and Mike were talking to uh, the mirror on the VHF radio, and Ed was doing a, an experiment called the OSVS, or the Orbiter Space Vision System, which simultaneously with the approach was taking camera data to uh, to research the ability to use cameras as a sensor for proximity operations. This is the view from uh, in close through one of the cameras. And uh, the system that Charlie just mentioned, the OSVS system, is a system which, if you see the three black dots, if you look at the orange thing in the middle, the thing is at 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 3 o'clock, there are uh, white squares with a black dot in the middle. And we had a system which was looking at these three dots to see if it could figure out our position relative to the mirror just based upon that. It's a system we'd like to use on the new space station. And uh, this was a test of how well that type of system would work. 
of course, uh, right here in the middle is the docking target that uh, we use to visually align. Uh, we visually align the orbiter in the, in the mirror in the last 30 feet referencing this target. Well, when we finally docked, uh, one of the highlights of the mission, of course, is opening the hatch. It was a very emotional period. Uh, you see great grins here, but uh, you should have seen the grin on Jerry's face uh, when we actually got through to him. Uh, actually, his grin was pretty big before uh, we even opened the hatch, just looking through the little uh, uh, window. Uh, this is a symbolic of uh, the union up there and how well we work together. Well, as much fun as the approach was to fly, and as intense it is, is, as it is, and as rewarding as it is to have it go so well, uh, being able to join with our colleagues on the other side of the interface was really a pleasure. Uh, this is a, a little gift exchange during an international meal. We had prepared some food to take uh, from the various, representing the various cultures of the crew members to uh, provide for the mere crew and to give them a chance to relax. And during that, we, uh, during that meal, we presented them with some gifts, one of which was a photo album uh, that documented the training that both Vasily and Sasha had done with us, and kind of a, a history of their involvement in the joint phase one program. And uh, here, uh, Vasily has the, his album open to a page that is uh, near and dear to me, and that's a photograph that uh, was taking, taken in two places uh, of Vasily and I, uh, first at Baikonur, where I was wearing his Russian Air Force uniform, and then here in Houston when he came to train here and he was wearing my American Air Force uniform. And so that was a little bit of a, a nice exchange for us and we included that in the uh, photo, photo album. Every day we had uh, many press conferences uh, on the board. Uh, uh, usually we spend at this press conference uh, in Space Station Mill, but sometimes um, in Space Hub. Because Space Hub, uh, we had double Space Hub, it was uh, a very big module. Uh, it, it was a big free volume. And uh, you can see uh, 10 people in this picture. It's free for us. It was very comfortable for us in the space head. The vast majority of our time was spent uh, obviously working hard and doing the transfer operations. And what we wanted to show you in this slide was a reflection of some of the things we did in the morning when our uh, fax machine, or our, we call it our tips machine, sent up the uh, daily activities. And we can thank uh, Greg Smith and uh, Mike Schaub for uh, all the great work they did on our flight plan. It was uh, miles and miles long, I think. But we had to uh, manage this paper every morning and uh, cut it up and put it in our, in our plan, and it uh, pretty much documented the activities uh, that we would do that particular day. On the second day after docking, um, we had international dinner. Uh, it was uh, Jean-Francois' idea, and uh, um, that's why uh, on the orbit we had food from China, France, America, Russia, Peru, different, different ki kinds of, of food. On this picture you can see uh, chocolate. Uh, this chocolate was, what did Eileen, it was shuttle chocolate. Over the months of training, uh, we'd gotten to be uh, great friends, uh, and we still are. That's why uh, we're all uh, monitoring closely the activities uh, up on there right now, because they are good friends of ours, in addition to Mike Full. Uh, here you see the, uh, the two flight engineers, or BORT engineers, uh, Sasha, or Alexander Lizardkin, but we, uh, I know him as Sasha. He's a good friend of mine. As a matter of fact, on that uniform right now, he's got a little uh, Peruvian flag that he, uh, he wears uh, up there uh, uh, for me. So good friend, and uh, this picture uh, kind of shows it, I think. <laughs> One of the, uh, the big things that we had to do was to transfer a couple of thousand kilograms of equipment to the mirror or back from the mirror. And Jean-Francois Jean and I were tasked with trying to keep track of what had already been transferred over and what needed to be transferred over or transferred back and what other room we had for carrying additional things over. And this is the picture of me and Jean-Francois going through the lists of of uh, equipment and uh, checking off items that uh, had already come, come back over from the mirror. Trying to get Mike uh, oriented to the space station and um, let's see where we're looking at here. We're into uh, Spectre as a matter of fact, showing Mike around and uh, had about five days of overlap and it was very critical time uh, just to get him uh, used to his new home. He kept wanting to go and have uh, 
tea with the crew, and I kept saying, get back over here, I gotta show you something. <laughs> <laughs> Next. As a matter of fact, if I might add, just for Jerry, uh, he raised the notch one level up for us before we docked. He had uh, sent us uh, plans of uh, what he would like to do for the transfer, and I think it was a, a really well thought out plan that has put Mike in a, a very good uh, status, and that was that as the equipment came from the shuttle, normally we would stow it temporarily in bags that it was transferred in, in a place that was convenient. And later, after the shuttle left, it would be up to the long duration crew member, in this case Mike, to find a place to put that stuff. And in this case, Jerry had an inventory plan already established so that while the crew was there, while the shuttle was still there, uh, he was able to not only transfer it over, but Mike and Jerry were able to handle most of that equipment and find a place to stow it permanently, have it inventoried, and film that inventory so that, it, that the inventory list could come back to Earth. And that had never been attempted before. It sounds easy to do, but when you're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of items that weigh up to 4,000 pounds, like Ed said, uh, that's an awful uh, daunting task. Yet Jerry was so organized that it went very, very smoothly, and it left Mike with a uh, great status for picking up on uh, his science mission. And base blocks, the containers you see that uh, Sasha has there are for uh, food. And after we eat the food out of it, then we, uh, they double for trash containers. And we usually put them on, um, on progress uh, to re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. Uh, in this case, we're actually able to bring some of those empty ones back on shuttle and also some with uh, a little bit of our nicer trash uh, back on shuttle also. You can see things are a bit congested, and uh, that's not an all unusual view. This is the node where uh, the internal EVA will take place from, uh, should everything be checked out and clearances and things like that. Uh, if you see the red arrow down there, that we uh, put in place after the fire. We decided it was a good idea to, for the uh, shuttle crew members to be able to find their way back to shuttle in the case of uh, poor visibility. So that area, or that arrow, the red arrow made out of Velcro cloth basically, uh, marked the quick way back to the shuttle through uh, Crystal. There's base block straight ahead. And you can't see too well inside that, but if you come out of base block, uh, oriented properly and you dive down. But uh, that specter over that way, and so you see some of the, uh, the ventilation duct is the large duct you see there, and some of the cabling that had gone into specter. And uh, of course that had to be disconnected, the, uh, the vent pulled through, the hatch cleared, and then a cover uh, was put on one of these flat covers. It's really not a hatch, it's, uh, it's a free floating plug basically, uh, that was then put on over that uh, module and uh, the minute it came close to uh, ceiling, it was a pretty solid uh, clamp down due to the differential air pressure. Uh, the future EVA, we're looking at taking this uh, more conical cover and uh, remove a section of that and add some uh, hermetically sealed pass-throughs to that section that Charlie's pointing out, and then uh, reconnect some cables that come from uh, inside the module uh, that originated the uh, solar batteries, the solar panels. Um, anything else, Charlie? Go ahead. Uh, I guess, did we cover all of the modules? We could uh, point out uh, this should be Perot up here, correct? Mm -hmm. And Cavant 2 off this way. And uh, we already mentioned Cristal down here, and we're uh, taking the picture. Eileen, you took it from inside from the, Soyuz. the Soyuz. And you, you might, I might also add, this is a very wide-angle view here, so you're, you're getting a big distortion of the reality. This is... Uh, you know, kind of a spherical uh, structure with all these hatches uh, 90 degrees apart. This is uh, a view of us. It's actually oriented sideways. It's of uh, me, Jean-Paul Saul, and Yelena sitting on the wall, actually, next to the bio rack, which is the thing at the bottom of the picture. You can see uh, a thing sticking out at the bottom. That's actually the glove box where you can put your hands into and work with biological experiments, which we carried up. We carried about 11 different biological experiments, which we did using this facility at the bottom included experiments on plants, white blood cells, uh, single-celled animals, and tadpoles, of all things. And uh, you can realize how big is the Space Hub, as uh, Elena said. It was uh, two modules put together. It was a very friendly uh, module to operate. And uh, we had the soft stowage bags. You can see the gold bags at the bottom. And we had also hard lockers for, uh, 
for storage. And uh, you, what you can see here is the, what we used to call the space hub crew versus the orbital crew because Elena, Ed, and I, we spent more time in space hub than uh, in any, uh, any other places in the complex. We even slept in space hub. That was very comfortable. And, uh, that was a good module for both scientific experiments and also logistics transport. Although uh, the, the main, uh, or most of the experiments we had were in the biorack, we had a lot of other experiments. And here you see a representation of one. I'm actually uh, using a video camera, almost as a microscope, videotaping the growth of some spores on a sample on a, on a radiation experiment we had, R&D. Uh, this is uh, still the Space Hub crew working uh, together on uh, called the samples of barrack that we have uh, stored in a passive uh, thermal control unit that could keep uh, samples to minus four degrees for several weeks without any uh, power, just passively. And uh, we had a lot of mini transfer to do of those containers of the various experiments from a freezer to a refrigerator to a passive control thermal unit to the glove box or incubator. And uh, we had about, we spent about 40 hours crew time on orbit on these uh, biorack experiments. Well, it's, this is uh, thinking about getting ready to go and leave the Mir, which was a very quiet uh, affair for us. Um, we scurried around, as I remember, we did something that I thought was really new and nice uh, prior to leaving. Uh, we, of course, had a little uh, get together for a TV downlink. Uh, with the control center and the folks uh, here on the ground. But we also asked uh, to have an opportunity to speak with a lot of the controllers directly on the loops in the control center. And it's, uh, it's amazing uh, how w nice it is to have the opportunity to hear folks' voices when you're in space. Familiar voices, people that you've been working with and that have put a lot of effort into this mission. So we had uh, Helen Dutton, payload officer. We had uh, Greg Smith and... Well, I'll probably forget all of them that got on the loops, but many people from the control center, uh, the flight directors, all got on the loops with us and uh, said a few words, and it was really a pleasant experience for us, and, and uh, it's just really nice to be able to hear the voices of the people that are putting so much work into an effort like this. Uh, but in any event, we, uh, we had a little uh, ceremony like that to say goodbye to the Mir crew, to say thanks to all the people on the ground that did so much great work to make this such a successful flight. And then it got real quiet, and it was time to, uh, to make sure Jerry got on the right side of the hatch. But I don't think that was a problem. <laughs> um, Elena didn't want to leave. She wanted to stay with her friends on the mirror. And uh, Mike was, of course, ready to get on with his work. So uh, we finally got the hatch closed, and it was very, very quiet. And uh, we were ready to, to get along with the, uh, the undocking process. Uh, a view, basically another big fisheye view, but you can see Spectre there very well. Spectre's uh, very good. Thanks, Charlie. Spectre's actually just, a, I think, the most beautiful, graceful-looking module. It's got these uh, four solar panels, of which you can see two here. And the one that, uh, that the progress collided with is the one opposite inboard. Uh, so it would be sticking out back that way. The one you see here is the equivalent solar panel. And the radiator is either the radiator you see here or one on the other side that uh, got dented in uh, during the collision. Um, but it's a spectacular view in general. And these, uh, the solar panels, for example, on uh, Spectre are just made of gold metallic uh, material, and they just glisten in the sun. And it's, uh, it's really a spectacular sight just looking at the sprawling complex. Before we leave this slide, I wanted to uh, make one other comment, a memory that was particularly special to me. Um, on the night of Flight Day 7, we closed the hatch, and we stayed docked while we slept, and then we undocked the morning of Flight Day 8. Well, that evening, I was able to see, we were all able to see in the window, the overhead window out of the shuttle, which is where this photo was taken, um, into the window in the base block that Charlie's pointing to here, which was uh, Sasha's room. Uh, Mike was in the window waving to us and the uh, cosmonauts were in the window waving to us, and I thought that was uh, pretty special, our uh, last chance to say a silent goodbye. Uh, next slide is on the undocking. Uh, we woke up the morning of flight day eight. Uh, we had very little time uh, to brush our teeth, and we had to get on with the uh, undocking uh, checklist. And one thing that was different about this undocking from the previous five shuttle mirror flights was that we did not do a fly around. Uh, we didn't get as many uh, pretty pictures as we would have liked, but we were able to do 
a very successful test of the European Space Agency's uh, ProxOps uh, system that they plan on using on their uh, orbital transfer vehicle for International Space Station. And it involved a laser, uh, the global positioning system, and some reflectors that you can see. Actually, they're very difficult to see here, but they're right around that docking ring. We flew straight down uh, the radius vector towards the Earth for 3,300 feet and had a, again, well, had a very successful test of that. Well, we'll uh, take a quick moment to show you some views of the Earth. Uh, each of us, of course, when we're on orbit, we like to look for where we came from. And uh, this is my hometown right up here, about where that cloud is, Hudson, Massachusetts. Uh, Cape Cod stands out like no other point on the Earth as far as ease of recognition. Uh, you have uh, the uh, Cape Cod Bay and Buzzards Bay, Martha's Vineyard Island, and Nanta uh, uh, yeah, uh, and I've lost track of it. Uh, in any event, you've got Rhode Island, Boston, and the Cape, and uh, just a, a wonderful view of uh, the state of Massachusetts. Uh, there was an evening when uh, we flew over this same area uh, late. Oh, it was probably actually 3 or 4 in the morning Houston time, and we could actually see, it was so clear in the east half of the U.S. that we could see from just about the same position looking back to the southwest, we could see New York, Philadelphia, uh, Washington, D.C., all the way to the tip of Florida. Uh, the entire peninsula and the, the coastline was lit up, and you could see all the way the cities of uh, Memphis, Atlanta, St. Louis, uh, all the way back up towards uh, Boston. And to have a clear night in the eastern half of the U.S. like that was a real treat. Michigan, if you spot it there, you kind of have to turn uh, sideways, and you see the hand of Michigan. And Charlie, can you, oh, laser, great. I won't keep up with you. <laughs> Get in trouble in your home states here. It's Michigan here. You can see the, the handprint if you turn sideways. Everybody got that? <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. You lay your hand this way and you got Michigan. And that's the way all Michiganders talk. They all say, okay, you, you know, you, you go on your hand and you say, all right, you take the freeway up here and you go over the Mackinac Bridge and then you're in the Upper Peninsula here. <laughs> and uh, Geography 101, of course, there's Lake Michigan. Chicago down in this area, Traverse City, beautiful spot, Mackinac Island, as pretty as it gets, and Detroit's down in this area, Lake St. Clair, connecting uh, Lake Huron here. Lake Superior, one of the biggest lakes in the world up this way. This freshwater uh, mass that you're looking at here, all the Great Lakes, is about, uh, I guess, the second largest source of fresh water in the world, and it just stands out. And then you get down here to uh, Lake Erie, and Niagara Lake Falls. Ontario. Niagara Falls right there. So it's pretty spectacular. You got all the Canadian cities here. I guess about eight million Canadians along the shores, and thirty some million uh, Americans along the shores of the Great Lakes here. And this again is pretty unusual to have uh, such clarity. And having been up 132 days, uh, I would say that when shuttle was docked and during the uh, return on shuttle, we had some of the best weather over the United States that I had seen uh, the entire stay up there. Corsica, the most famous uh, French island. Uh, as you can see, it's, it, we could call it the thumbs up uh, island because there is a finger pointing up. It's called uh, the island of beauty. Uh, this is where uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was born. This is where I met my wife. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is about two, 250,000 people living there. And, most, uh, this is a, a kind of how, uh, our Hawaii Islands, just one hour flight from Paris. And uh, many French are going there every summer for the vacation. It, uh, uh, the, the population is multiplied by 10 about in the summertime because it's always clear, like you see no cows, and there are a lot, a lot of little creeks that you can consider your private creek for uh, bathing in the sea. Well, this picture's kind of special to me. Uh, even though I grew up in California, I was born in Lima, Peru, and that's the town of Lima, right, right in this area here. Typically, it's always clouded over, so they told me uh, I, I probably wouldn't be able to get this shot. Nobody's been able to get it before. Additionally, all we had were night passes over Lima during our waking hours, so I actually had to stay up uh, one night and take this picture uh, just a little bit because it seemed like one hour after bedtime every day was when we passed over the west coast of Peru. But uh, you can see um, from the coastline, you head pretty quickly, you get right into the Andes and the 
the ground rises pretty steeply to the east. This is the island of Oahu in Hawaii. It looks nothing like a hand or fingers or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it's a uh, beautiful place. I was uh, lucky enough to get to live there for three years along with Carlos. I'm not with him, but <laughs> <laughs> at different times, but he lived there too. This is the city of Honolulu right here. Uh, it's really one of the prettiest places on earth, I think. Uh, you can see the runway at the airport there, which is a big runway constructed out of coral, which they uh, dug up off the beaches out here. Um, I lived right about there. You can see my apartment if you look very carefully. <laughs> There's a small airfield up here where I used to fly small airplanes off this coast, watch whales, which would congregate along this coast here. And this is a Volga. Um, Volga River enters uh, the Caspian. This Volga, Delta. It's Caspian. Caspian is the um, world's largest uh, inland sea. Uh, the Volga, I think it's maybe the largest river in the whole world. And the pr principle, it's waterway uh, of Russia. On the uh, north part of Caspian, it's Ural, other river. The dimension uh, the Caspian are 1,750 uh, miles from north to south, and uh, maybe two, uh, 200 miles from uh, west to east. On the Catan Island uh, is one of the several volcanoes. Uh, this is Russian Kurilus Island uh, chain. Uh, Unakatan has two uh, volcanoes, and uh, one of them um, last erupted in 1952 uh, years, and other uh, last erupted in 1938. Some of the most historically interesting places on Earth, in my opinion, uh, for us were the passes over the Mediterranean Sea, and in this picture, we're looking west, and we see the islands of Greece. And if you look closely to the north, uh, actually it would be to the south in this picture, you see Africa. We also have Turkey at the bottom, and the Sea of Mamoru, which extends into the Black Sea. And off close to the horizon is Italy, but we can't see that very well because it's under clouds, as well as uh, Yugoslavia. A couple things that are interesting about Greece uh, if you remember from your uh, history classes in grammar school, were the wars between uh, Spartan and uh, Sparta and Athens. So I looked for where these cities are, and Athens is right here. And they were a seafaring civilization, and Sparta was just a little bit farther down, right in here, and close by land, and they were the uh, land warriors. Uh, we had one pass over Greece at night, and you could see a lot of small cities uh, scattered all around the peninsula. But again, just looking down, and the many passes we, that we had over this area as well as the Middle East are just uh, mind-boggling when you think about all the history that has gone on on the Earth below. Oh, this uh, comet Hale-Bopp, which all, all of you I'm sure are familiar with, was uh, getting farther and farther away from the sun, and I'm not even sure if it's still visible now. But we were able to take a picture of it from orbit. Uh, during the time that we were docked, the orbiter was in uh, attitude control called inertial attitude hold, which meant that we were relatively stable to the uh, background stars. And we took advantage of that opportunity to mount a camera uh, just after sunset. Uh, the comet was in the northwest uh, portion of the sky relative to the Earth. And this was an eight second exposure. We took everything from a one second exposure up to 30 second exposure, and this one came out the best. And you can just barely see the tail, the second tail of the comet in this picture. A uh, little bit of a structure of mirror uh, is in the way. And of course, the Earth, which was rotating below, has came, come out a little bit smeared in this picture. But I think it's really special because you can see the Earth's horizon, um, or should I say the Earth's uh, higher levels of the atmosphere. Well, it's uh, time to uh, put everything back away for deorbit prep. And uh, we got back in our LESs and uh, prepared for deorbit. We were fortunate to be launched on time and landed almost on time. We had one 
uh, rev delay to uh, watch for the weather. But we came in on the expected day to uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we had a little bit of weather to deal with, as I mentioned, but uh, nothing extraordinary. And a uh, great team that put Atlantis together for us. Uh, we hope we had brought it back in just as good a shape. It was amazing that this entire flight, uh, there were zero anomalies with an Atlantis. And that really speaks well of the whole NASA team. Uh, it is a pure pleasure to be able to fly a vehicle like this when it goes perfectly well as it did for us. I think we had maybe one transducer on entry that was uh, kind of flipping a bit. But other than that, we can't really speak to anything in an anomaly fashion that, uh, that went on throughout the whole flight. And that's really a, a miracle piece of work by the whole team. Well, to deorbit, we fired the ohm engines in the back to slow us down and uh, dropped us back down into the atmosphere. And this picture was actually taken not during the deorbit burn, for anyone who's thinking about it, because when we do fire the engines for the deorbit burn, the payload bay doors are closed, and you can't see this. So this picture was actually taken earlier, but we put it in this place to talk about the deorbit burn. And uh, you can see uh, it was actually taken during one of our rendezvous burns. When we were uh, adjusting our orbit to catch up with the mirror, taken at night. And you can see that the glow from the engines actually makes the tail glow, which is a, which is a pretty amazing sight out the back. And uh, after nine days and a few hours on orbit, we brought Atlantis back to the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, we had a nice day to bring it in for the landing. Uh, we learned a lot, I think, from the whole mission and from the landing as well. Uh, since the landing, Eileen and I have both had a chance to go out to uh, Ames uh, to work the vertical motion simulator. And uh, we had a couple of little things that uh, were of interest for the landing, uh, one of which was a significant crosswind gust down below about you know, 15, 16 feet before touchdown. And uh, interestingly enough, the engineers out at Ames uh, were able to duplicate that in the simulator so that we can show that kind of wind gust to future crews. And it just uh, was rewarding for us to be able to go out and see that in the simulator, that something like that could duplicate uh, nearly identical condition that we saw in flight. Uh, the orbiter behaved very well in that gust, uh, elected not to go chasing it. Uh, we drifted about 30 feet left of the center line, put the wheels down, and then after we brought the nose down, we corrected back to the center line. And uh, uh, we brought uh, Atlantis to a stop down there about uh, 8,000 feet from the approach end and gave it back over to uh, the STS-89 crew who's getting ready to go, or 86 crew, sorry, who's getting ready to go do this all over again for us and continue the Charlie, down. can I interrupt and one second? Jerry, go ahead, yeah. This is uh, off the wall, but I need the vote of the audience here. Um, <laughs> I was in space 132 days, uh, four hours, one minute, and my wife, Catherine, was waiting the whole time and worrying if I was going to get back for the birth of our next child. And she's heading into the hospital right about now, so I'd like to excuse myself, if possible. <laughs> but here can... I think we can let him go for that. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Well, with that, let's go ahead and uh, roll the video. There's another view of our patch, and we're getting ready to uh, go to the vehicle in the uh, OPF. We're putting on our LESs and uh, getting ready to, to uh, check out good pressure integrity in everybody's suits. Carlos is uh, buttoned down with the visor down. There's Mike, and uh, he was relaxed and ready to go to space. Jean-Francois was, too. <laughs> Elena, uh, joining us from Russia, of course, and a uh, very pleasant day for us to go out, of, although it was 4.30 in the morning. I know many of you probably went down to the Cape and had to stay up all night to see it. Uh, it was a real nice night for us, and the weather was gorgeous, and uh, they tell us that we were visible almost to Miko. Our liftoff, our, actually the countdown and the liftoff were totally flawless from the crew's point of view. We just uh, lit up the sky all the way up and down the Florida coast, so we're told. That view in the corner is the view I had through the overhead window. I had a mirror in my hand that I could look out. You can actually see the VAB going by as they do the roll program. The f I like to talk about the feelings that you have during a launch. Uh, it's actually very much like the shuttle uh, simulator. 
There's a lot of shaking and rocking going on inside. You can see out the window flashes of light uh, that sometimes can interrupt your vision if you look outside too much. Um, also, the sound is like, uh, to me, it's like standing in a room that's on fire. It's just a, a very uh, low-level uh, sound that's uh, very similar to what you hear outside during a launch. Solid rocket booster separation, and uh, from this point on, we're back to 1G as we slowly accelerate up to 3Gs and then main engine cutoff. Next thing you know, we're in orbit. We've separated from the tank, and we are taking photographs of the tank here crossing over the northern part of Africa. Post insertion, the uh, main activity is to activate the, the experiments, and here the space hub, the main uh, uh, cargo in the payload bay, and we had to open the three doors to access into space hub through a very long tunnel, as you can see. The space hub was very clean, and uh, we spent a few hours to set up uh, the whole module for the experiments and also get ready for transfer ops. This is a, a neat picture of a rendezvous burn. I lost, <laughs> <laughs> I lost my hat there momentarily, but uh, we get a pretty good acceleration out of the Ohm's engine when we uh, make our approach to the mirror. We burn several times. Here, down at the bottom, you can barely see the station. Uh, we had a very low beta angle, they call it, which is the angle between the sun and our orbit plane. And that meant that the, the mirror was actually going to eclipse the sun for us. You see it's getting dark in the orbiter. And there goes the sun, and there's the mirror. And to see that on orbit was amazing, because the mirror actually glows white, because the sun that you can't see is still bouncing off of our payload bay doors and illuminating the, the mirror. There's a view that uh, Jerry was able to see of us approaching. And, uh, and then again, our centerline camera view during the, the approach. This. Uh, Step by step, we get a little bit closer. And of course, our task is to inch in uh, gradually according to a, a given timeline. And uh, everything worked so well for us that uh, we had a very uh, docile contact. And you can see the sun was just about to come up and rise over the Ohm's pod as we contacted. So this is all silhouetted here. But uh, we make a, a very soft contact there and uh, almost no oscillations after, after capture. Everything went smoothly on the pressure checks, so we had the opportunity to, to open the hatch right away and get a good, good view of uh, our colleagues on the other side. Well, here in this shot, you'll see what you weren't able to see in the uh, still picture earlier, which is the, uh, the true feeling of joy and uh, celebration we had. Uh, Lena brought in traditional uh, black bread, salt, and tea. Uh, there's um, uh, Vasily. First time here, you'll see Jerry for the first time. And uh, just look at that smile on his face. Uh, and, I, and the obvious need for a haircut. Uh, they'd, uh, <laughs> they hadn't had a vacuum cleaner for a while, so we helped fix them up there so they can get their haircut. And uh, we proceeded on in uh, to do our first uh, press conference in the, in the base block. And uh, here's Eileen's uh, attempt to confuse all children throughout the world as to how we really move around in space as she swims through the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we continue had our, uh, our first press conference, uh, which was uh, shortly thereafter followed by eating of the bread. And uh, actually, Jerry had his uh, pretzels that he'd been wanting. And as uh, Elena already mentioned, the second evening uh, on the dock phase, we had an international meal with food from all the countries represented by the crew. We had food from uh, Russia, America, Peru, China. We had, of course, food from France with foie gras and confit. Here, goat cheese. And uh, no, we had barbecue no, from. No <laughs> <laughs> we had barbecue from Pete's, uh, dehydrated. And, uh, <laughs> for three hours, the ground never called us, and we had a very good time in the room. Here you see a chocolate uh, gift from ESA with the logo of the different partners in the International Space Station program. All and kinds of food down here on the table. As you can see, the chocolate shuttles uh, flying around. <laughs> Eileen thinks that some of them may be stuck somewhere behind panels. <laughs> it was really neat that this was all spontaneous, too, to have that kind of a, a good time with our colleagues up there. This is uh, some of the handover operations between Mike and Jerry, uh, as Jerry and Mike discuss uh, 
the equipment that's being brought over. And here we are to, with uh, the commander of the station, Vasily, trying to figure out uh, which items uh, we need to bring over next, back over to the space hab. Looks like Vasily's stealing something there, but that's actually his checklist he's taken with him back to the uh, mirror. <laughs> Carlos brushing his hair in the mirror. Yeah. Hair management is very important on orbit. <laughs> this is the mirror base block. With, you can see the table where we had dinner the other night. There's Mike uh, having his lunch, and uh, Sasha and Vasily. You can see. Uh, how much equipment is around inside there, and it's actually one of the more spacious modules. Uh, in some of the other modules, there's quite a bit more stuff. This is Sasha's bedroom. You can see that he has a very nice view out his window. There's a shuttle parked out there today. <laughs> this is one of these uh, beautiful historic views that I was telling you about earlier. Um, you can see the Red Sea, the uh, Gulf of Suez, the Gulf of Aqaba, the Sinai Peninsula. Of course, uh, we're docked in here at this point. Um, here's the Nile River down at the bottom. You can see the Nile uh, Delta. As we uh, move on further to the east, this is the Volga River Delta uh, that we're um, flying over Asia at this point. Again, you can see the docking module on the left side that was added on STS-74 about a year and a half ago. In this view, uh, up from the docking module, you see Cristal, and then Spectre to the left, Cavant 2 to the right, uh, base module at the top. Well, all good things uh, had to come to an end. Uh, we worked very well together on board. Uh, we worked so efficiently, we had time to have meals together, and then we had to say goodbye. Uh, this was a much more somber occasion than uh, we'd had on docking day. Uh, it was actually fairly quiet until we decided, well, it's time to start uh, uh, saying goodbye and uh, working our way out the door. Uh, there was no great rush to do this, and luckily uh, the ground was able to give us all the time we wanted to, to get this done. Here we see the, uh, the hatch closing, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this was quite a sad time for us, and it was very quiet as opposed to, as opposed to the no, very noisy time when we uh, had docked. Uh, here's the undocking. Uh, you can see the shuttle jets firing, uh, separation. The springs in the, uh, in the uh, docking mechanism give us the initial push off from Mir, and at approximately uh, just a few feet, uh, two feet after we separated from Mir, I fired several jets to uh, get us uh, separating down the R bar. We had extra fuel, uh, because Charlie had done such a great job on the rendezvous, we had extra fuel to spend during the uh, separation. So uh, we had reached uh, quite, a high, quite a high separation rate uh, to increase the efficiency of the undocking and the test that we were doing. View from Mir that was downlinked of the shuttle. Uh, the Mir had great views of us because they were looking down at the Earth, but all we had was a view of Mir uh, against the dark sky as we looked up. After undock, it was time to resume more intense activity on the scientific experiments here. You saw Barrack, uh, Elena, Ed, and I were uh, all scheduled for those uh, about 10 different experiments uh, using the Barrack facility incubators and glove box. And you see here Elena working on the uh, Osteo Mars, these uh, experiments on uh, bone cells. We had also, uh, the glove box was used for uh, experiments where some uh, dangerous chemicals were used. Here are some tadpoles that we are developing their uh, neurovestibular systems in ZOG, and we are not swimming as the same uh, tadpoles uh, grown on Earth. This is an experiment to look at the motion of liquids inside rotating tanks, which you may ask, why is that important? And the reason is because fuel tanks on rotating satellites have a pr often have a problem where the, fu the fuel inside them starts to rotate in a different direction than the rest of the satellite, which makes the whole satellite wobble which is not something that satellite designers like to have on their very expensive satellites. So we had a uh, set of rotating tanks here, and you can see the fluid inside there rotating back and forth around inside that tank. And it's, you can see it's rotating in a different direction. This is a view taken from the inside. We also had several experiments where we drew uh, protein crystals. Uh, that's a, a new field uh, that uh, we've actually flown many times now on the orbiter. And uh, it's... Uh, stands to uh, give us some great benefits in the future as we develop uh, 
custom medicines uh, and for diseases that are uh, a challenge to the community right now. This is the output from our fax machine that I was talking about earlier. <laughs> we wanted to illustrate how long this really is, extended all the way down the tunnel into the space hab. Um, view from the space hab, uh, this is our meal time. Uh, you can see the space hab is extremely spacious and it's a very comfortable place for astronauts to work, to live and work. Uh, Jerry's showing us uh, some of the fresh tortillas that we had packed um, that uh, lasted the whole mission. This is not a bubble. This is actually a blob of water that Jean-Francois had uh, made from a straw in one of his drinks. And we did our own uh, liquid motion experiment informally as a crew as we watched the behavior of these uh, things in space. Uh, one of the things we have to watch out for is the uh, degradation to our bodies when we're on orbit because we're not really fully utilizing all our muscles. So we had lots of opportunity to exercise either on our ergometer or cycle or on a treadmill. Um, Jerry probably logged more miles on orbit than uh, at least anybody that I know. <laughs> uh, but uh, he uh, provided a lot of feedback to the community here on this uh, treadmill that we're developing for station. <laughs> Another form of exercise here, uh, the, the, the mass tunnel uh, motion. <laughs> Actually, right here we are. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, almost missed it. Going off the top of the screen right now is uh, is Lima. Once again, we, uh, the, uh, the ground was able to get this shot for us one uh, night while we were sleeping. Uh, in the view right now is the Nazca Desert, where you have those great lines in the sand out there. We couldn't see them from on orbit. This again is Hawaii. That's the big island up at the top. And you can see the string of islands stretching down below. Uh, Maui, Molokai. We had a very, night, uh, very nice night pass over Italy. You will recognize the boot of Italy and Sicilia, and the moon glint on the Mediterranean Sea in between uh, Sicily and uh, Italy. At our orbital altitude, we see about 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. Uh, the Earth is on top in this view. And it looks like a sunset. In, I guess in reverse, it could be a sunrise. And it's time to come home. This is a, a, a clip of our deorbit prep. Everyone uh, suited up just so about two hours or so before the deorbit burn. It's a very hectic time. There's many things to do. The payload bay doors are coming closed. It's a major part of the events in coming home because once the doors are closed, you lose the radiator cooling. This is a view from the mid-deck. We're intentionally showing this upside down because many times you need to work upside down in space and do it effectively. On the flight deck, you see Jean-Francois in the middle. There's uh, Charlie uh, reviewing procedures for the entry and myself. We had Ed, Lou, in the uh, mission specialist number one seat. Uh, Carlos is in the uh, MS2 seat, is our prime flight engineer. The entry, you can see out my windows, the heating. Uh, we reach uh, almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside as we uh, re-enter Mach 25 and slow down. You can see the jets fire. A plasma develops, as you know, around the orbiter. And we can see the reflection of that uh, out the overhead windows. Well, we're back uh, close to KSC here, getting ready to approach subsonic. And you can see the jets uh, pulsing there as we approach uh, the Kennedy Space Center. This is uh, a view from the ground of us coming around the hack. And uh, you'll see here again in a minute my view out the front window of the head-up display. And uh, you've got uh, airspeed in information and altitude information on the scales on the left and right, as well as the position of the runway. Uh, outlined for me so that when we come down through the clouds here at about 8,000 feet, we'll break through the clouds and you'll see that the runway is in fact exactly in that position, showing just how precise the orbiter's navigation system is. And uh, you'll continue to see our view down through the, the lower right corner here as the orbiter starts its pre-flare. And uh, coming into 300 feet, Eileen puts the gear down. You saw the gear word flash there. Coming into the overrun here uh, with the gear down at uh, well, about uh, 50 feet or so, you can see uh, with this view the wind gust that catches us right here at about 20 feet and starts moving us to the left. And we just put the right wheel down first to arrest the drift, and uh, once we got it on the runway, it uh, handled quite nicely. So uh, little surprises come from time to time, but the orbiter is a wonderful machine, and it handles that kind of thing just fine. We uh, rolled it down the center line stripe and uh, 
Jerry was hooting and hollering all the way home, of course. <laughs> and uh, we were happy to bring him home. And that's the story of STS-84. Thank you very much.